Thank you for coming in this shiny afternoon in such a large number. And uh, indeed, um, uh, I am doing these things as it was nicely introduced uh, by Professor Finizio. Um, today I'd like to speak about uh, the concept of autocratization, autocracies in, in general, hybrid regimes between democracy and dictatorship, and also about the transformation of Hungary from the democracy to autocracy, and uh, electoral autocracy, and also to say uh, some words uh, about this uneasy relationship uh, between Hungary and the European Union. This is the first time of the history of the European Union that among the member states there is a non-democratic state. It was unimaginable, you know, like 15 years ago, because the Lisbon Treaty and some foundational documents simply excluded this possible. The founding fathers did not even think of this opportunity that one of the member states would decide to move to an authoritarian direction. And in the shadow of war that reflects on on the war in Ukraine after the Russian aggression and Hungary is a neighbor country and still has a sort of third way politics uh, there. I will elaborate on that uh, in a minute. So let me now go to the, um, to the subject and uh, you know there are several concepts of political change. Uh, by the way, this picture shows Hungary in 1956, at the time of the anti-communist, anti-Soviet revolution. So, there are very abrupt, uh, direct, uh, quick changes like coup d'etat or revolution. There, there are more incremental transformations like transition. And the transition can be democratization, moving to democracy. And if there, there is some sort of electoral, basic level democracy, then it can be a further consolidation of democracy. And when you, once you have a consolidated democracy, there can be a danger of deconsolidation of democracy. Uh, you know, my American friends now, some of them are really afraid that uh, maybe the American democracy will decline. Others don't think, but there is a debate about it that, you know, one of the um, homelands of democracy can be uh, de-democratizing. De-democratizing meaning the opposite of democratization, uh, uh, an autocratization or democratic backsliding. There are so many concepts, you don't have to memorize that, democratic erosion, democratic recession, uh, democratic backsliding that is very very often used that a formerly democratic country sliding back to an authoritarian regime. Some people question the validity of this concept. What does it mean back? Uh, maybe there is a new system which is emerging and not simply going back to the previous one. And then there is this concept of autocratization, which, uh, which is a more overarching concept. It is not just the decline of the quality of democracy, but it, is all, it also means that the, the democratic decline uh, goes beyond the border of democracy towards autocracy. So these are the fundamental concepts, and I will use mainly the last two, or particularly the last ones. So how can a democratic country decline? What are the ways of de-democratization? Um, you know, in the 28th century, there were a lot of military coup d'etats, um, particularly in, uh, in um, Latin America but also in southern Europe and other places in the world. So the military takeover is a classic case of, of uh, going back to autocracy. 
And the other is uh, the revolution from above, like a democratically elected leader destroys democracy violently and introduces a dictatorship. So Adolf Hitler was elected in 1933 in Germany and he used his democ democratic legitimacy to destroy systematically the political order, political democratic political system in Germany. And um, the third op op possibility, foreign occupation or assistance, uh, if you have a military occupation or secret services uh, operating within the country, then it might lead to dictatorship. Uh, Eastern Europe after 1945, that's a good example. Uh, the Red Army, Soviet Union occupied Poland, Czech part, Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians, Romanians, um, and uh, introduced, not only liberated from the Nazi troops, but also introducing their own political system. So that is uh, an external, uh, externally introduced installation of a dictatorship. And uh, if you have an authoritarian leader and an unstable democracy, um, maybe the democratically elected leader makes a, a, a strike on the democratic institutions. It is different from the second point, because in the second point there is already an existing democracy. Here there is sort of transitory democracy, moving towards democracy, but that is unfinished and uh, there is a preemptive strike. It is like um, Lukashenko did in Belarus, who was democratically elected, but then he eliminated democratic elections for the next 30 years or so. And uh, there are two more left. One is crisis management by protectors or technocrats. Uh, you know, if there is an ethnic division or civil war, ethnic war, um, low intensity tensions for a long time, sometimes sometimes uh, civil uh, uh, warfare uh, or the danger of civil war, then uh, maybe the NATO or the European Union can install a caretaker government saying that you will be the guardian of the regime and you will guarantee peace and stability. So it is like Bosnia-Herzegovina today, uh, Bosniaks, uh, Croats and Serbs exist there in the same country, territorially divided, and, uh, and uh, it was under the guardianship of Europe in order to uh, guarantee stability. So there was no intention to develop this country towards democracy because, because there was an ethnic, ethnic divide and an ethnic uh, conflict continuously. The, the goal of this government was just to heal this pain and just to create a stability. So some analysts called these countries stabilitocracies. The European Union just goes there and intervenes in order to maintain stability, but they are not that much interested in you know, picking these countries as next members of the European Union. So basically the European Union enlargement is frozen. So there is some talk about, you know, be, uh, inviting maybe Montenegro, Macedonia, North, North, North Macedonia, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but nothing happens really. These countries are waiting just like Albania, uh, but uh, the prime concern for 15, 20 years was not to repeat the Val Balkan Wars, and uh, keep them as stable as possible. So the, the role of the European Union was not to support democratization, but to support stability. So uh, that was a, either technocratic or guardian leadership. And finally, hollowing out stable democracy from inside, uh, the leader uses high linkages with some core countries, to deconstruct full democracy step by step. So it's not the second, which was, you know, the case like Hitler did or uh, 
Mussolini immediately destroying democracy when they came to power and actually Mussolini was questionable whether it was a, any democratic um, election behind him, and not at all, while uh, Hitler had some democratic election. And uh, number four is the Belarus case, Lukashenko. Uh, uh, he, was, he, he had not yet, not yet chance to establish democracy. He prevented democracy. But in the last case, that is Viktor Orban in Hungary, and sometimes it was Kaczynski in Poland, but it is not anymore. Um, uh, there was a functioning democracy in the case of Hungary for 20 years, between 1990 and 2010. And then a uh, guy was democratically elected with a huge majority, and he used the huge majority to rewrite the constitution, the electoral law, to control the media, and occupy the key institutions and introduce a sort of hybrid regime. So after a relatively long period of liberal democracy, returning it, and, uh, and I think it is not the case for Erdogan, because in Turkey there was no liberal democracy. The Erdogan case, uh, uh, again, a special one. It is, uh, you know, uh, moving from a more electoral democracy towards uh, electoral autocracy. Um, and uh, what are the symptoms of this gray zone? Because autocratization doesn't mean that we are jumping from democracy to autocracy one night. It is an incremental, longish procedure. You know, people should accommodate themselves that maybe now there is less freedom and the next year a little bit even less freedom and you know, it's a, it's a slow, slow process going down on the way, and people, you know, learn how to behave in this situation. It is a very interesting research topic, maybe some, that some of you would be interested, uh, the, the behavioral aspect of uh, autocratization. How people, some people don't want to acknowledge it, and they resist and protest, uh, if it is unsuccessful, many people are just leaving the country because the borders are open and uh, they go abroad, study abroad, find jobs abroad. You know, like uh, 100,000 of Hungarians are working in Austria now. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, what happens if if there is no protest and they, they cannot afford to go abroad or they are not that young, they are pensioners or older people, so they stay there and how their behavior is changing, how they are trying to convince themselves that it is after all not as bad, how they try to trust the good leader, okay we don't have democracy but there is a benevolent leader, you know, so it's, uh, the, the social psychology of autocratization is also interesting, not just the pure, hard uh, political science uh, systemic approaches. So disrespecting democratic norms, political capture, that is uh, the elected elite occupies the state from inside, and creating uh, a hierarchical centralized system of rule when Royal professionalism, expertise are not so important, but loyalty is. Loyalty is overrides expertise, and the leader speaks on behalf of the native people, that we are the Slovaks, the Romanians, the Serbians, the Hungarians, and uh, so the political community is defined along ethnic lines. So. So what, what about those who, are, who do not belong to this ethnic majority? Are those excluded from the nation? Uh, maybe they cannot get uh, uh, citizenship. So, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a problem. And uh, then uh, speaks on behalf of native people, condemns foreign elites, migrants, refugees, and consider them as enemies. Like... Uh, in 2015, there was this big uh, refugee crisis, 
um, all over in the Balkans, Turkey, uh, Greece, Serbia, Hungary, and many people were, were moving to Germany. That was the period of Willkommenskultur by Angela Merkel, who was the Bundeskanzler at that time, uh, accepting them. Uh, but uh, already Viktor Orban was resisting to, to this uh, soft policy, saying that all these Syrian migrants are potential terrorists. So trying to, you know, um, identify refugees with migrants, economic, political refugees with economic refugees, saying that those are not political refugees, just want to get richer, and, uh, and anyway they are potentially terrorists. So, so it was a, it was a, in, a, in many countries where there was no Islamophobia at all, the political elites tried to create that in order to, to keep their populist uh, voters base, voting base and the populist majority behind them. A similar like Trump is, has been doing against the Mexicans, the Latinos in, in the southern border of the United States. So, uh, social autonomies, free press are increasingly considered as dangerous, NGOs, independent think tanks, uh, independent universities, for instance, even public universities. But, uh, this is still not the classic dictatorship when people are imprisoned immediately or killed. Uh, they really pay attention to, to play a sort of clean game. Not killing people, not, there is no open violence, only just regular unfair elections, which, uh, which is good for the leader because he can present himself as a democrat in the international stage, um, but he is not, but he can present himself like that. So, so they realize that uh, the media has an exceptional power these years in the world, and it doesn't look really good if uh, the CNN and uh, BBC and the world press, the world media, just shows a lot of uh, young people on the streets uh, beaten up by their own police or by their own military force. So it does not give a good image to an autocracy. So it's better to, you know, be non-violent and rather uh, using existential threats and structural violence but not open physical violence. People lose their job, for instance. You know, in, in, in Hungary, for instance, but maybe in some other countries as well, Russia, Belarus, uh, public servants must be very, very careful if they use Facebook at all. And it is advised to them not to use it, because if they make some comments which is not preferred by the authorities, he or she can lose his or her job immediately. And the other thing is that the regime is based on fears and traditional mentalities rather than any direct ideology. So mentality is important. So propaganda and mentality, the old political culture, is better not to say anything, just, uh, just to, to try to survive, survival values. Uh, are, are used by the regime and these mentalities are favorable for them to, to rule. And not really ideology, because the ideology is something which, which has some rationality, some doctrines, some logic, some, some structure. And uh, authoritarian leaders don't like any sort of this disciplinary um, structure which might uh, condition their way of uh, doing politics. Uh, still with the symptoms of the emerging gray zone, uh, as I said, it is more like uh, based on mentality, not ideology, and propaganda, very heavy propaganda. I was pretty much surprised to see also in Russia uh, that propaganda is still 
can be effective. So it is different from the communist times. The, as I said, the borders are open. Uh, it is not the Cold War, not the period of Iron Curtain, but there is still a central propaganda with a lot of trolls who try to, uh, if there is no censorship as such, they just try to neutralize independent opinion by raising the level of noise in the social media. It, it, it can be a very noisy space, everybody is saying this and this and this, relativizing facts and truth, and uh, at the end people don't uh, distinguish, cannot distinguish between truth and not truth. So that's the regime of post-truth, as it is said. So the regime is in constant flux, the consolidation is difficult, and therefore um, um, uh, the, the leader can, uh, can manipulate the regime and can create a, a continuously molding situation, what he calls uh, consolidation. But this regime cannot consolidate itself in the traditional sense of the word. Corruption is not deviant, it is embedded legislated and networked phenomenon. For instance, uh, there is a corruption perception index and, uh, and uh, Hungary is the last one among the European countries, among the 27 European countries, uh, the most corrupt country and, and there are a lot of African and uh, Central American countries which are doing much better than Hungary on that sense. And also leaders can learn from each other. That's interesting. Maybe some of you remember the Arab Spring, when uh, there were uh, from uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, and uh, even uh, Armenia, and uh, even late in, uh, in uh, Turkey, some sort of hope of democratization or some move to less uh, autocratic regime and uh, people were at that time 2010-11 very hopeful about the democratizing effect of the social media uh, flash mobs uh, you know uncontrollable protests and so on but uh, it turned out that the regime authoritarian regimes can use very well these social media uh, for for um, manipulating the participants and they can uh, teach each other so there is no one single blueprint for autocratization these uh, leaders are learning continuously from each other you know uh, Orban and Vucic and Erdogan and Putin and Lukashenko and maybe even the Chinese leader and the Indian leaders, so, so they refer to each other. I mean, I was shocked when Donald Trump mentioned Viktor Orban in the presidential debate in September um, between Kamala Harris and uh, Donald Trump, and uh, quite unprecedented that the Hungarian leader is mentioned in a presidential debate in the US. So, so there is some sort of uh, common knowledge how to distract uh, democratic institutions and and how to how to expand power that is also called in the literature as executive aggrandizement that the executive leader try to use his formal powers to go beyond uh, beyond these things so that's about it and uh, and what is the use uh, of the last uh, five, ten years, I would say ten years, when, when the, the country belongs to the European Union and the leader still wants to keep some sort of uh, halfway status between democracy and, and autocracy, so then the, the leader enters to a cynical and hypocritical game. So, so one of the lessons of this uh, strategy is that cheating 
And hypo being hypocritical, it is uh, somehow inherent part of the regime. The lack of honesty and the lack of trust. And trying to say that, well, we are, we are uh, implementing the European reforms, for instance. But in, in reality, not. They just, uh, there is just some legislative acts and, and nothing else. So, so if in a country um, which is ruled informally by the leader using their family members and friends, and not even the party is important, but the friendly circle, then, uh, then it is very hard to discipline the leader to keep the formal rules because the whole logic of rule based on informality and not formality. So, so, and also there is a strategy for reorganizing the property, which is not the case in Western Europe or, or Western countries, like uh, nationalization, and uh, saying that the state will nationalize these certain industries, and then redistributing, re reprivatization. So something which were already privatized in the early post-communist period is renationalized for a few years and then reprivatized to France. This is how they try to make the elite change uh, 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 in a in a society in which the property was already privatized and uh, there was a return to capitalist economy after the communist regime. So, what is this hybrid regime? In most of the cases uh, between 2010 and today, these regimes, and the Hungarian regime was a hybrid regime that is between uh, liberal democracy and full autocracy. And the most interesting thing is that, uh, of course, there are some uh, elections, but those are dishonest and not clean elections. You can see on the left the liberal democracies, hybrid regimes, and full authoritarian regimes on the right. And of course, in the full autocracies, there is no free election, non-existent. There is no way to power via elections. And uh, opposition is either hollowed or banned. And on the other hand, here the hybrid regime took some formal element of democracy, but they emptying, hollowing out in reality. So elections are not fair, there are a lot of manipulations, and uh, the incumbents exploit the state. So it is not that political parties are running for power, running to, to win the elections uh, on an equal basis, but uh, there are opposition political parties trying to run, and there is the, the incumbent, uh, the government party, and the party is using the state, and the state has uh, a lot of resources. So, so the opposition parties are not competing with the governing party, they are competing with the state, which is of course non-democratic. De non there is no even playing field. field. So that is what is in, happening is the uneven playing field, ex access to resources, media and law, uh, is limited. Opposition activities are legal but disadvantaged. And incumbents almost always win the elections. I'm saying almost because in an authoritarian regime it is for sure that the opposition has no chance. In a hybrid regime, accidentally, if there is some external uh, configuration, the incumbents can lose elections, but they can lose one out of ten. So that's the typology between liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes. That is the hybrid regimes. But uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the Wieden Varieties of Democracy Institute in, 
in Gothenburg, Sweden. That is one of the most uh, authori uh, authoritative, the most influential democracy measuring institute in the world. There are some others, the Bertelsmann Foundation, the Freedom House and others. But this freedom is, uh, they developed a very fine-tuned uh, measurement, measuring political system, longitudinally. They publish every year uh, a progress report, whether what, the, what about the state of democracy in the world, and they are ranking countries and also describing countries, and they introduce not these uh, three categories that liberal democracy, hybrid regime, autocracy, but uh, uh, full democracy, electoral democracy, electoral autocracy, and full autocracy. So the two parts, electoral democracy, electoral autocracy, means that only elections exist basically and nothing really else. So, and uh, elections are important, inevitable, but not the only thing for democracy. I mean, elections happen every four years. What, what, what about in between? You know, if there is a government governing non-democratically, then we cannot call it democracy, even if there is a democratic legitimacy due to the elections. So, so I think, uh, I think uh, it is a very smart approach, these four elements. And uh, electoral democracy is still considered as a, as a diminished type of uh, uh, democracy. Uh, which, is, which cannot display all the democratic elements. Uh, electoral autocracy, on the other hand, is, is on the margins of the hybrid regimes, uh, closer to the autocratic field. And uh, this is the definition of uneven playing field. So hybrid regimes are civilian regimes, Formal democratic institutions exist. Uh, those are widely considered as the way to come to power. Maybe it is not honest. Maybe the opposition is also part of the system. Now there are there are some genuine opposition movement coming from outside the system, and they blame the existing opposition parties that what did you do so far? Nothing you are also part of the system, even if you claim that you were opposition. So, so it's, it's also an interesting uh, element of hybrid regime that we don't know what is real and what is fake. Is it a real opposition or just a fake opposition? Plus the government also creates uh, fake opposition parties or compromises formerly existing real opposition parties and they start to behave differently. So, so it is always a very difficult and ugly uh, game to discover who are with us and against us from the oppo real opposition point of view. And uh, I, as I said, the incumbents are abusing the state and these re regimes are competitive but they cannot uh, cannot basically win just in exceptional cases. They are not democratic regimes because the playing field is heavily skewed in favor of the incumbents. There might be competition, but that is unfair. That is Levitsky and Way, famous book, uh, <clears throat> Hybrid Regimes After the Cold War, Competitive Authoritarianism, Hybrid Regimes After the Cold War, let me give a distinction here between competitive authoritarianism and electoral authoritarianism. In the first, there might be a real hope for change, a real competition. Opposition has a hope. In the electoral democracy, there is only the legal possibility for competition, but not a real competition. And when we are coming closer to Hungary, I would say that uh, it is not that new. Uh, if we go back to the 1990s, 
we remember or we can study that there were some hybrid regimes. It was considered as a child disease of democratization that you have communist dictatorship, a hybrid regime, and then democratization, democracy, and EU membership. So that was Romania under Ion Iliescu, Slovakia under Vladimir Mečer, Croatia under Franjo Tudjman, Yugoslavia, the smaller Yugoslavia under Slobodan Milosevic. I wonder whether you ever heard about these names, any of these names. Uh, if, some, if some of you is familiar with any of these guys, just raise your hand, please. Ah, okay. Uh, who knows, uh, who heard about Iliescu? Okay. Mečer? Not really, that is Slovakia. Smolka. Franjo Tudjman, Croatia. All right. Slobodan Milosevic. He ended up being in Den Haag at the criminal court. And uh, there was a huge uh, student protest and global, uh, national protest against him. He was a very strong post-communist nationalist leader. And here are the stabilitocracies I was talking about. So, and Bosnia-Herzegovina can be considered as a hybrid regime, just like North Macedonia, Montenegro, Kosovo. Uh, and uh, what about the new autocracies? What about their tactics? How do they behave? So they have the traditional coercive strategies, they use it less and less. Uh, they use it not only offline but online. And also there is an active preemptive authoritarianism. Vitaly Silitsky uh, described the Belarus regime in 2006. And there is also hybrid tactic to to control the opposition, like surveillance, legal persecution, selective enforcement of ambiguous laws. Um, you know, it was uh, Chavez who said that uh, I can use the law to favor my friends. Uh, and he famously said, to my friends, I give everything. To my enemies, the law. Meaning, the law is selective and biased. And as I said, cheating is an important element of the regime. Andras Chayo published a book, Ruling by Cheating, 2021, Cambridge University Press. Anybody who is interested in the legal aspect of uh, authoritarian regime, I can recommend on that book. And our, our most recent book, it is falsely stated 2022, in reality 2024, relying on traditional mentalities and propaganda. So for a couple of years, Hungary and Poland were considered as the two outliers uh, of democratic Europe, but there were huge differences between the two. That is Jaroslav Kaczynski, who was the leader of the far-right party, ruling party in Poland, and that is Viktor Orban. Kaczynski came to power in 2015, and he was, he, he, he was winning in 2019, but lost in 2023. So Poland had an exper experiment of democratic backsliding, but actually, they could not change the constitution, so they, uh, they remained within the framework of uh, democracy. While Hungary started with the change of the constitution, two-third majority, so Hungary has an autocratic uh, constitution, and Poland has a democratic constitution, and now they returned, they returned to, to democratizing with uh, Tusk, who is the new Prime Minister. However, uh, even if the differences were huge, uh, it's interesting to, to pay an attention to the Kaczynski regime of these eight years. The leader had no formal functions. 
And you can read, I don't want to read uh, everything which is written there. Uh, I, I selected the dimensions of governing party, power, centralization of power, ideology, elite behavior, cultural values, religion, social policy, economic policy, and foreign policy. And there were huge differences because Poland is a very religious country, so they really took it seriously. Nation, um, national Catholicism. So, for them, nationalism and Catholicism or Christianity went together, which is a contradiction uh, in reality. They were very strong on uh, trying to introduce an anti-abortion policy. They made it more difficult, the abortions but they could not ban it. And, uh, and uh, in terms of cultural values, they were uh, relying on patriarchal family values. In the meantime, the economic policy was still the neoclassical, neoliberal, pro-market policy. And the foreign policy was very strongly pro-EU, pro-US, pro-NATO, it was even more pro-NATO than pro-EU, because they criticized Brussels, but they never criticized the US. They, they said that uh, there should be a US base in Poland in order to be able to defend themselves from Putin. So that is an anti-Russian, anti-Putin position and very pro-US position. Why the Orban regime in Hungary, uh, again, the same, exactly the same dimensions, the leader is also has a formal position as prime minister and the elite behavior is not puritan and not religious at all. It is hedonism, cheating, hypocrisy, enjoying the power for itself. So it is a sort of... Uh, uh, um, doesn't have a higher value to approach. So using the power just for the sake of power cultural values, patriarchalism, but much more strongly anti-gender, anti-vogue, anti-progressivism. And the religion was politicized and instrumentalized. Hungary is basically a rather secular country, but still they used Catholicism, Christianity, in order to have a political advantage. Because for a right-wing party, it is good to, to get closer to the Catholic Church. And Orban needed the infrastructure of the Catholic Church, gave them a lot of money in order to create another pillar for the regime besides the party and the state. So the mafia state, the party, the family and friends, and the church. So this is classic. I mean, if you go back to Franco or Salazar, uh, the church institutions were vital to maintain uh, anti-democratic rule. And uh, the economic policy was a mix of nationalism and neoliberalism. And the foreign policy has a big surprise uh, after the Russian aggression of uh, Ukraine. Uh, everybody expected that Hungary as a neighbor country, who, which was invaded many times over its history, by Russian forces back to 1848, 1945, 1956. Soviet troops were stationing in the country for 30 years. And yet Orban was experimenting with pro-Russian, pro-Putin, uh, uh, sovereignist propaganda. It was uh, Putin who used the notion of sovereign democracy uh, like 15 years ago or 20 years ago when he was still an acceptable figure. And by sovereign democracy he meant that there are different forms of democracy and not only Western liberal democracy is the pattern. That is just one form. And there is another form for Russia, which is the sovereign democracy. Um, so basically that means that you should not tell us what to do because we know better than so you know, this sovereignist propaganda is, is quite strong these days in 
in those countries, not only in Hungary, but in Turkey and, uh, and uh, in the Balkans in some countries as well. And a critical position to the EU. And, uh, and these are the characteristics of the Hungarian autocratization. Uh, it was a deconsolidation until 2010, global economic crisis, polarization of the two major blocs. Suddenly two blocs emerged as antagonistic uh, enemies. And then autocratization after 2010. And uh, uh, I would say an authoritarian accommodation after 2015 because uh, they introduced a state of exception, extraordinary situation due to the refugee crisis and that was renewed all the time, renewed every half year and that was renamed that it is a state of exception because of COVID and now the state of exception because of the war in the neighborhood. It, it's not the case in any other country which exists in the last 10 years in the state of exception. They introduced, like France introduced the state of exception and other countries under the COVID pandemic. But, uh, but when the COVID went, uh, the gun, then they returned to the normal democratic conditions. Uh, here in Hungary, exceptional rules were embedded, made as part of the constitution. So normalized, normalized the abnormal situations. So normalization of the extraordinary, that is called consolidation. Very strange. Uh, so just like the corruption is not a deviant behavior, but a system part of the regime, then a consolidation is just a normalization of the extraordinary. And the EU membership has, on the other hand, some crucial effects on the regime, because Hungary is not alone with this. And this graph just shows this black line is Hungary. That is only to 2017, but already at that time there was a major uh, decline in democracy scores, according to VIDA. And Poland went down a little bit, but after 2023, they again started to go up. So, and now I'd like to just highlight a few books because, uh, uh, what, I mean, it's a small country. It's a small country. Um, usually people don't pay attention with good reason. But now what we experience that, that Hungary is in the limelight of uh, international attention and uh, dozens of books have been written about the re Hungarian regime, uh, different aspects. So Peter Wilkin, this book is 2016, Hungary's Crisis of Democracy. The other is Andras Pop, 2017, Democratic Decline in Hungary, Law and Society in a Neoliberal Democracy. And then there is a collection of essays edited by Kovács and Trenci, Brave New Hungary, mapping the system of national cooperation because the, it's not only a hybrid regime, it has a name by Orbán, the system of national cooperation. It sounds a bit fascistic to me, this, this name. Uh, and then there is another set of books Valid Magyar was studying the Hungarian state and he found this, described this as a post-communist mafia state. And that book was published in 2016 by CEU Press and he was focusing on the corruption mechanism within the state. How the state is operating, is there any state, how the state was occupied, etc. And the other is the uh, dynamics of an authoritarian system that is more like an empirical sociological investigation about the, all the deeds of the regime, very detailed. I would say even boring in some ways because it is more focusing on the empirical part and not 
nothing about the theory. They use the notion of political capture as a theoretical frame, but it can be used as a text, as a, as a handbook of the crimes of the Orban regime. And here uh, the Orban regime, plebiscitary leader democracy in the making, uh, that is a more sort of favorable. Uh, they don't say that this is an autocracy or hybrid regime. They claim that this is a leader democracy, Führer Demokratie, uh, referring to Max Weber, actually. Max Weber used this Führer Demokratie. So, uh, so they say that this is still a democracy, but the leader is very much populist and personalist, and he manipulates the masses, and he poses, uh, he, he is running the government like always asking uh, the voters, uh, are you with me or against me? So it's a, like a permanent plebiscitary situation. Uh, I think uh, they are a little bit too kind to the regime. It's, it's not just a leader democracy. Max Weber, when he was writing about leader democracy, he was thinking of the US, actually, when there is a reliable democratic mechanism and there is a particular position of the president. This is how Weber wanted to connect the charisma and the bureaucracy. To, to make a good mix out of the two. It is a bit of uh, expansion of the idea of leader democracy to non-democratic behavior. And another set of books, uh, it will be not endless. Uh, this is an Italian, uh, my friend uh, Stefano Bottoni, uh, a half Italian, half Hungarian guy. He lives in Budapest, but also teaching in Bologna. He wrote a book, uh, first published in Italian, second in, in Hungarian, and then third in Romanian language. Probably there will be at one point an English edition. Orban, una despota in uh, Europa, so we, or un, dis, un despota in Europa. Uh, it is, he's a historian, so that's more like a history book, uh, it, uh, telling the development of the region. And this one, civic and uncivic values in Hungary, it is more about values, political culture, religion. Uh, that is 2024, a uh, collection of essays. And that is uh, Gabor Scheiring, he's an as assistant professor of Georgetown University, currently in Qatar. The Retreat of Liberal Democracy, Authoritarian Capitalism and the Accumulative State in Hungary. That is a more sort of Marxian or Marxist or post-Marxist approach, uh, emphasizing that Orban uh, represents a particular stage of capitalism in which populism tried to favor the domestic capitalists vis-a-vis -vis the external investors. So it's a little bit uh, like Latin America, you know, that sometimes the the external multinationals taking over the economy, and there is a reaction when the domestic uh, entrepreneurs and the domestic uh, capitalist class try to go against. And he says that the Orban state is not promoting competition, rather accumulation. By accumulation, he means, you know, the uh, reorganization, restructuration of the of the property of the, of the people. And finally here, this is our book, uh, 2024. I am sorry, I am a bit proud of this uh, embedded autocracy. What is the logic behind this? That we found uh, not satisfactory just to, to describe this regime by political science concepts. So, uh, from a political science point of view, this is an uh, this is an electoral autocracy. You know, autocratic practices, sometimes elections, and there is an opposition existing. But it does not describe this electoral approach. Does not describe the everyday life of the regime. So therefore, we 
picked for this uh, social uh, sociological approach embedded uh, autocracy a little bit of reflection to uh, Charles uh, Polanyi uh, famous sociologist and also uh, also a political German political scientist who introduced the concept of embedded democracy the full democracy is embedded democracy and the others are the defunct democracy I forgot his name he is working in Berlin at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin. So we, here we try to uh, combine the historical overview because we believe that now this is a historical period. 14, 15 years, it is longer than um, the period between 1933 and 1945. Uh, so it is not just an accident, it is now a trend. And uh, the scary thing is that it is not just the backyard of Europe, a small, uninteresting country, but it can be an infection to other European countries. Uh, now this country, Orban, is leading the third largest group in the European Parliament, the Patriots. Um, Maloney is not part of this, the Italian Prime Minister, but others like the French right-wing uh, Le Pen is part of this, and Orban and some other far-right parties belong to this group. So, so still, uh, still there is a hope by Orban and his followers that the far-right can establish firmly itself in Europe, in Austria, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in France, in Hungary, in Serbia, and hopefully in other places. So this is the the plan. This is the vision. So, I, uh, therefore, we in uh, in uh, in the first chapter we describe the mechanisms of deteriorate, deterioration, and then the next uh, four chapter discusses the historical aspects and the chapter six the the relationship with the European Union, chapter seven the transformation of judiciary, the autocratic legalism and uh, the last one is the aspects of legitimacy and personalization of power how the propaganda functions uh, so what about the European Union uh, European Union was created there was a European community as you know from the 50s and 1992 it became a European Union emphasizing the uh, greater collaboration possibly federalism uh, later on and they created this Copenhagen criteria in 93 for the applicant countries what criteria should be fulfilled if an applicant country wants to join the European Union and maybe you are aware of this already there are political criteria, economic criteria and legislative uh, alignment sort of uh, capacity, state capacity, capability of accepting all the membership responsibilities. Uh, so, but the monetary uh, aspect was emphasized as, as well, competitive EU markets. So, so the emphasis was more on the rule of law and the market economy rather than democracy. But on the other hand, they said that these are binding principles. So it's not that you know you can pick some of these and forget about the others. But here we have the Lisbon Treaty, 2009, uh, which says that uh, you know they wanted to create a constitution, but it failed because some countries voted against a unifying European, all European constitution. And uh, this Lisbon Treaty was the substitute of a constitution, so they infused some values finally here. The Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. 
These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, no discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between women and men prevail. So it is a very strong statement. After all, it's a value system. If you sign, all countries, including Hungary, signed this document, they had to comply it. And this is what they are not, not doing. And here, democracy is uh, explicitly stated, not simply the rule of law. And the European Union is a interesting multi-level policy. There is the, uh, some regional levels, then the domestic uh, national levels, and then the larger regional level, and then the European level. So there should be, there is a nation state level and the federal superstructure. So, so actually uh, um, a, a country cannot just say a member state that this is, we are standing here, and the European Union is out there. This is the game what many populist politicians are playing. That we are the Slovaks, Polish, Hungarians, and those are the EU, or rather Brussels. They say Brussels because, because they cannot say that they, they don't have anything to do with the EU because for each country is part the EU, actually, so they cannot uh, make a distance from them. And the uh, EU, because it is a system, and the member states are, have their own system, so the EU has systemic functions constraining, supporting, and legitimizing the uh, regime. So even if the European Union tolerated the Hungarian hybrid regime in the 2010s, there was a constraining power as well. So, so the legislation was supervised. You know, the Strasbourg, Convent, Strasbourg uh, judiciary was functioning, Luxembourg as well. Um, there were some binding rules that the whole government signed, and they received a lot of money in exchange for that. So, actually, the EU supported the Orban regime for a long time or if not openly supported, enabled it, enabled uh, the ruling elite appropriation of public resources, EU cohesion transfers contributed to the abundance of misusable funds. So, so there was a naive belief that these monies will arrive to the member state and the responsible domestic elites, political and economic elites, will fairly distribute and disseminate these monies and giving it to the poor, to the disadvantaged region, to the infrastructure, etc. But uh, there was always a lot of tricks, you know, to, to give to those entrepreneurs which are close to the Prime Minister in the name of developing the underdeveloped uh, regions. So between 2014 and 2020, Hungary received almost 4% of its uh, gross national income, GNI, from the EU cohesion fund. So it is a big uh, amount of money. So between 2010 and today, these countries received more than the Marshall, Marshall uh, Plan uh, countries received after the Second World War. And Italy, France, Germany and other countries received a lot of money to rebuild their countries after the Second World War. So actually the EU have contributed to the public resources and the modest growth of the economy and contributed to the stealing these resources and the stability of the regime in 2010. So autocracies can survive easily if there is an economic development. And there was an economic development. The problem started with the pandemic and with the war in Ukraine when suddenly the Hungarian economy was declining and unable to maintain the previous 
the tempo of development. So actually the EU has a regime supporting function and also a regime legitimizing function because these uh, authoritarian elite members regularly participating in European Union committees, uh, they can send um, MPs to the European Parliament, so they can play that we are democratically elected uh, players in the, on the European level. So uh, the lack of sanctions and the lack of open criticism up until 2021 contributed to the legitimacy of the Orban regime as a, as a there's some sort of democratic regime. So this, uh, and, and, and also one should mention the corruption of the European party politics, because Fidesz had 12 representatives, which was a large group of people, and these people were members of the European People's Party, and Manfred Weber was the leader of the European People's Party, the faction leader, and he needed these 12 votes in order to have the majority and to make the e European People's Party as the largest faction in the European Union. So I would say that European Union is not innocent in, in uh, issues of uh, political corruption. And they tended to overlook the domestic problems as long as Fidesz was loyal to him and voting together with the EPP in Process. And, uh, and finally, the regime constraining form function. Uh, up until 2021, that was relatively moderate. They had to keep the, or the by and large, uh, um, um, prescriptions. Uh, but uh, on the EPD, finally, in 2000. 21 decided uh, to keep uh, Fidesz, the Orbán's party, out of the party family. That was a very much a decisive action when they realized that the pragmatic advantages cannot uh, be more important than some basic principles. And then finally the European Union decided to withdraw financial support uh, from Hungary and uh, due to domestic corruption and also because of blocking some EU sanctions toward Russia after the outbreak of the war. So the policy of Orban was to, to make attractive Hungary for Chinese and Russian investors as a European country, repackaging Chinese products in Hungary and selling it within the EU as a European Union product. Um, basically lifting every barrier from China to, to come and then to, to sell their products without, uh, without uh, high taxation. Uh, and, uh, um, even if in the 2010s Orban and other authoritarian leaders try to try to play a sort of peacock dance that I am inside and outside. Uh, I am loyal to you in Brussels, but I am against Brussels at home. Uh, so there was a hypocrisy. Now there is no more hypocrisy. It is quite clear that uh, Viktor Orban is serving Russian interests, which is quite incredible at the time of war, when not only political concerns, but moral concerns uh, should also matter. So, finally, returning to the backsliding issue, uh, I think uh, it is not simply Orban. It is a misunderstanding of Hungarian politics, which says that all, only Orban caused everything. Orban was a symptom of a, of a complex problem. Unfair redistribution, inability to stand up for collective rights, collectively protesting, and, uh, and also the lot of uh, 
uh, poor people who lost with the speedy privatization after the transition to democracy. So post-communist managerialism and, uh, and uh, insensitivity toward the losers uh, pushed these people who were originally leftists pushed to the far right because they didn't fight anybody else, just the far right. The far right said that uh, forget about your identity as a worker. First of all, you have an identity as a Hungarian. You don't have to perform anything. It's enough if you are a good Hungarian because then we will be supporting you. So that was a very comfortable offer by the far right and Orban was doing that. And uh, these are the three major elements of the political formula of the regime. Personalism, populism, and authoritarianism. And, uh, and uh, well, that is a sort of monopolization and homogenization, what is going on. A moral claim for leadership and... and, uh, and uh, also presenting the government as a rebel against Brussels. So it has a monopoly of power at home, but still it sells its policies as a rebellion against an even larger power, the European Union. So it's uh, sort of strange. And as I said before, so these are the elements of the political formula, and also these are the uh, the foundations, the roots of the regime, mentalities, traditional mentalities, paternalist political culture, social conservatism, anti-LGBTQ, anti-gender, patriarchal family, much more openly than before. Uh, Donald, the election of Donald Trump will help Orban in that respect in a major way. And the religion nationalized and politicized. Christianity is understood as national Christianity, as Christendom. And the church plays an increasing role in public uh, education. Uh, there are villages when the only, church, the only school is uh, operated by the church. So, so there is also an ethnic divide here because of the Roma population. These are in the public school and the better schools are run by the church, so the non-Roma people send their children to the church school. And what is also interesting that particularly at the time of the Palestina-Israel conflict, uh, that uh, as I said, Hungary was not a... There was a dis traditional anti-Semitism, but that was oppressed officially by the communist regime and the far right was anti-Semitic traditionally and uh, but then after 2015 suddenly Orban discovered the power of Islamophobia and he somehow combined anti-Semitism and Islamophobia saying that global elites global entrepreneurs like George Soros and others they want to open borders to let those poor uh, Islamic migrants come to Europe in order to destroy Christianity, destroy the traditional European values. So there was a conspiracy theory presented here that the Jewish financial capital is helping the Islamic migrants to come to Europe and destroy the traditional Catholic and Christian interests. So, Coded anti-Semitism and open Islamophobia went together, hand in hand, in the government propaganda. And there was uh, this imagined alliance between the global elites and the Islamic migration. And that was presented all the time in a permanent propaganda campaign. Actually, Orban is a totally pragmatic, uh, unprincipled when he needs to find uh, friends in the international arena outside the European Union. He might go to Putin, to Xi, to China, or Modi, India, uh, sometimes uh, trying to establish some friends.
friendship with some Central Asian countries and Iran. Uh, he was praising Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan for the strong leadership. Thank you very much. But it's, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, one more sentence. But I am saying as a Hungarian citizen, thank you very much that these guys are our friends. Uh, but, but he tries to be a friend of Erdogan and Netanyahu at the same time, who are arch enemies. So he, he really collaborates with Netanyahu on a major way, and he feels that this uh, uh, triple alliance with uh, Trump and Netanyahu will be for him uh, quite safe to stay in power. On the other hand, when he visits uh, Ankara or Istanbul, he presents himself as the biggest friend of, of Turkey. So it's... Uh, uh, it's... Uh, uh, totally contradictory, don't uh, expect uh, consistency in politics in general, but in this type of politics, never. I skipped the impact of COVID because time is running, and that is the, uh, that is which really made Orban infamous, uh, this friendship with Putin, which doesn't seem to end. So that's a friendship never ends, and uh, and uh, when I said autocracy promotion, they are learning from each other, and Orban is learning from, from Russia, trying to weaken the EU, trying to block EU sanctions against uh, Russia, but still staying within the NATO and EU. So it's amazing that a NATO member state is doing, doing this. And, uh, I was optimistic when there was, there was this attack on Ukraine that maybe this will be a, a new moment for rebuilding Europe on a moral basis, uh, defending democracy and supporting Ukraine. Uh, but it, it is not really the case, although there is some sort of consistency. But uh, that is the optimistic reading that I suggested, this chance of redemocratization. The pessimistic reading is the rise of a new global authoritarian trend. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Andras. Now, it's your turn. Yes, but there are a few minutes, yes, for, for comments and questions. So if you like to, to raise your hand and... Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Katarina, I'm from Romania. And um, when, I, um, uh, when I was hearing about the autocracy and the... Uh, authoritarian regimes, I remembered Hannah Arendt, which said that um, countries in which totalitarian, totalitarian regimes are, uh, are characterize, characterized by the fact that the population is very uh, implicated and fired up by uh, ideology, ideologies, but in the authoritarian regimes uh, the population is passive and it, it is not interested in the political exercise of uh, in exercising their political rights. And I would like to hear about to hear your opinion about this and how is the civil society in uh, Hungary now? Does it uh, use its uh, political rights apart from voting? Uh, is does it have uh, Interested in this, or is it more uh, passive? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Anna Arendt, in his famous book, uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism, really a great book, uh, and she is an excellent author, one of the biggest thinkers of the 20th century. She said that the totalitarian dictatorship is based on ideology and terror atomization of the society and a very heavy propagandistic ideology. And uh, 
And indeed, the authoritarian regimes, as, as Juan Lins uh, explained, they are uh, relying on mentality, traditional mentality of the people, the church, some social habits, political culture, but not the state don't want to ideologize or propagate. It's like the late Franco regime or late Salazar regime. Not much talk about ideology. Forget about ideology. It is, uh, it is just, you know, survival and maybe there is a better life, better material conditions. So, so totalitarianism is over-politicizing and authoritarianism is depoliticizing. And what is interesting in this Orban regime that it uh, it promised uh, new politics, repoliticizing the society, but in fact, in, instead of politi politicizing, they just uh, pouring propaganda on the civil society. See? This is what they call politicizing, pouring propaganda and so on. So, propaganda and and uh, and mentalities. For Anna Arendt, that was propaganda, terror, and ideology. And here, propaganda and mentalities. No ideology and no terror. So it's an interesting combination. And the civil society is, uh, has been isolated. There were always protests, but, but they never, never show, demonstrated any solidarity with each other. So at one point, the, the, the teachers went protesting, then the students, then the nurses, doctors, whatever, the fire workers. But there was no broad social front against the regime. So, so it was more like every social group tried to find their own little advantage. That maybe, maybe we will have better if we just uh, stay sh shutting up. Uh, and the other thing is that the borders were open and the borders are open. So if the protest doesn't lead anywhere, it is just a very easy option to, to go abroad. And, uh, you know, in, in the communist regime it was not the case because there are very closed borders and people had no other chance just to just uprising or protesting after a while, staying silent, but then uprising. And here, the most innovative, the most active elements of the younger civil society, younger part of civil society, are leaving the country. So actually, that is good for the authoritarian leader that the borders are open. And, and still, due to the dramatic changes and the backsliding, there is a um, better organization now than it was five years ago. So there is a rising opposition movement now, which is at the moment more popular than Fidesz. And there is an opposition leader, his name is Peter Magyar, and he is organizing a, a, an alternative. In Hungary, the next elections will take place in 2026, and uh, many people strongly hope that we are approaching the last uh, years, last moments of this regime, and Hungary will return at one point to democracy. But it will be a very long ride because of the regime based itself on mentality, so people's mindset will not change so quickly. Would you say that uh, now Orban has the power to suppress uh, protest in case uh, the civil society would ri raise, rise up? For example, in Belarus there were very violent protests. Not violent protests, but they were protesting. Violent the... oppression, yes. yes. Yes, Would you say it would be oppression. a situation like this? Could it be a situation like this in uh, Hungary? Uh, the legal conditions are established for that. So there are extraordinary powers for the those ministers very close to Orban 
who oversee and control the secret services and the police, secret police and, and the military also. And because there is a state of exception, so not the normal condition, therefore, theoretically, the Hungarian military force can be used against protesting Hungarians. But in reality, I think it's uh, very difficult to imagine that those people will kill their compatriots. So, so it, it would be the last instance. I think the regime doesn't want to do that. But uh, it's hard to imagine also that one day the television will say that, OK, Viktor Orban lost the election, and this is the new prime minister, and that's it. So it's, it's very difficult to imagine. So he's not going to give up his power so peacefully. Maybe he will leave the country and go to Africa or, or Brazil. Bolsonaro is a good friend of him. Or, uh, he also visited Milay. Mm -hmm. Milay. Milay, when he was uh, inauguration ceremony. But uh, I don't know. It's uh, just speculation. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm from Romania as well. And as a law student, I was wondering regarding the part of your presentation um, focused on EU's constraining function. Since Hungary is one of the EU member states that has quite a few uh, decisions pronounced by the European Court of uh, Justice, the Court of Justice of the uh, European Union, um, which is besides the legal, let's say, function and uh, role of these decisions, mainly focus on rule, rule of law issues and so on, which is the impact of those decisions in the Hungarian society on the judicial, let's say, part of the Hungarian society? Yeah, uh, originally the Europe was unprepared for sanctioning Hungary because they they can only sanction some violations of, of certain elements of the rule of law. And then they, there is a legal case and it takes uh, three years to, to sanction those who are deviating. And this was the game in Hungary by, by Orban that they introduced something which was illegal, looking from Brussels or Strasbourg. Uh, but by the time they made the decision, Everything was implemented, so they could not go back originally, the original. So, so uh, it took a while when Europe realized that they have to take a systemic, legal, systemic approach to the deviant member state and not just case by case. So it's not like a checklist that you check that, okay, this has constitutional court, they have ombudsman, this and this, okay. You have to see the holistically the system and not just the element. And the European Union was unprepared for this because it was not designed to discipline non-democratic states. It was uh, uh, designed in goodwill that all countries will stay democratic. And, uh, and then they figured out that if there is a misuse of the money, that the European taxpayers are sending to Hungary because that's the European taxpayers' money. And if there is a systematic misuse of money, then they can ref uh, refer to that and not to general democratic principles because it's hard to interpret. But if, if it is proven that the money was stolen or misused and uh, it's a chain, uh, then, uh, then they decided to withdraw the money. And I think that is wise. That is a wise decision. But Orban domestically communicated that now Brussels is punishing us because we are not complying, not loyal to Brussels, and they are punishing us. Not because we are not meeting the requirements, the basic legal requirements, but for political reasons, they don't like us and they punish us. And, uh, but I think now the majority of the population 
uh, they do not buy this argument anymore. Of course, they say that it would be good not to punish the population because of the wrongdoings of the government. But as long as this government is re-elected, they say, well, you voted for this government, now you have to see the consequences. Yes. Uh, <coughs> good afternoon. Thank you for your lecture. I was wondering whether, uh, given the context that um, there is no mechanism of exclusion of a member state in the European Union and Article 7 of the Treaty of the European Union only uh, states that um, one member state can have its voting rights suspended or be suspended as a member state in the European Union. Uh, what would be the most effective mechanism, in your opinion, that could discipline Hungary into, uh, I don't know, obeying democratic principles and, uh, well... I think uh, withdrawing the money uh, uh, for a while, it, it was a good uh, disciplinary power. Uh, and uh, it was a wake-up call for the Hungarian civil society also to reply to the previous uh, question. So, so suddenly, uh, uh, European voters uh, became, uh, uh, started to protest at their own government, the German citizens, that I am paying the tax and you are giving it to Hungarian government and the government is misusing it. And uh, so there was an increasing pressure from the Western voters and also from the Hungarian voters, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the tendency is that uh, the government must be punished, but not us, ordinary people. It's very difficult to, to in increment. And uh, uh, this Article 7, it, it cannot really be used effectively. It is already started, I don't know, seven years ago, in 2017. Um, no real impact because because all countries have to have the same opinion and uh, and uh, there is always one which votes against this so it's very difficult to find consensus politically and even other leaders don't like this because then it, maybe at one point it can be used against them so they want to to have this precedent. So rather they tolerate Hungary patiently and uh, they just waiting that something will happen. And then they can wash their hands that, you know, we withdraw some money and finally democracy is restored in Hungary and let's go back to the good old way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the recent uh, re-election of Trump shows that uh, people are willing to live in a less democratic society if their material conditions improve. So the question is, uh, how can we combat this loss of interest in democratic quality? Uh, that people are uh, ready to leave the country, you mean? Or I, I did not catch your... No, uh, it's like the, the people... Um, approve it to life in societies less democratic if their yes. conditions of life are better. So Yes, uh, I think that that's the case. Unfortunately that is true. That uh, welfare and security um, economic development these are very important factors and democracy is is sort of abstract category for many people. And uh, many people just identify freedom with free travel, that they can just travel, and that's freedom. And it's very hard to argue. And therefore, autocratic regimes can be uh, shaken when there is a sudden economic decline. Because if they are not democratic, at least they have to perform economically well. If they cannot perform economically, then they immediately become invulnerable. Yes, I think we are. Yes, done. we are done, and our time is over. So, Professor.